So thank you everyone for staying here for the last keynote speaker that we have today, Monday, May 2nd at the Keeping It Polite conference here in Ottawa and online. Our last speaker is Michael Bernstein at Canadians for Clean Prosperity. He's Clean Prosperity is no stranger to us. They've been supporting us with their amazing research all the way along. Um, we, we quote you intensely and we really appreciate all the work you are doing, Michael. I will hand this over to you. There you go. Great. Well, thanks, Kathy. Thanks for having me. And it's really a um, pleasure to be back with everybody from CCL Canada. Um, you know, I see all the great work that, that you constantly do. Um, and I'm always amazed by the efforts and the passion, commitment, and the knowledge that everyone in this group has, the folks on this call and the many who I know are, are, are here in spirit and will be probably watching things on recording. And I hope that uh, we have a chance to be back with you in person another time soon, whether it be Ottawa or Toronto or somewhere elsewhere in Canada. So as Kathy said, I'm Michael Bernstein. I'm the executive director of Clean Prosperity. We are a nonpartisan advocacy group that uh, looks to find ways that Canada can reduce its emissions in a way that is good for Canada's economy and affordable for Canadians. The chief policy that we focused on for much of our almost 10 year history now is carbon pricing. Um, and I, will, I thought what I would do today is talk a little bit about where we are and from my perspective, in terms of the climate journey in Canada and the effort to, to decarbonization, just to kind of set the stage briefly, and then talk through that about why carbon pricing is so critical from our perspective, and what some of the things we need to do are to improve that policy in order to make sure it sustains itself through different changes in government, and that we can improve it to make sure it's even more impactful going forward from an emissions reduction perspective. So that'll be the general arc of, of the, the comments I'll make. And I'll try my best to keep it to about 15, 20 minutes max. I understand the session goes to 1.15. If that's, is that right, Kathy? Yep, okay, great. I'm getting a thumbs up. So that'll hopefully give us enough time for questions, which I really look forward to. Um, so let me start with a bit of an overview. No, I think, and you've probably heard from other speakers that there is some good news, I would say, from a Canadian climate policy perspective in that uh, today, unlike last year or even a few months ago, we now have a fairly comprehensive blueprint for how the federal government intends to reach the 2030 goals of a 40% reduction of emissions relative to 2005 levels. Um, we have the most detailed plan we have ever had in Canada for what policies will be put in place to achieve that goal. And carbon pricing, of course, as many of you may have seen in that plan, was called the cornerstone, cornerstone rather, of that plan, which is uh, certainly something we agree with, and we're glad to see it get uh, rightfully its place as one of the marquee policies. Now, that, so that I think is the good news, is that we have some momentum, there are additional policies with each successive year, and even it feels like multiple times a year, we are moving the ball forward. Having said that, I think one of the big challenges that we face now is that we have so little time to achieve that 2030 target, or for that matter, the ultimate target of net zero. And when you look across the set of policies that were announced by the federal government, what you see is many dozens of different regulations, spending programs, um, in addition to carbon pricing as the anchor policy. And what I really worry about, how are we going to, how is the federal government working with partners, external stakeholders, provinces, territories, indigenous groups, but how, are, how, how is it going to be possible to achieve everything that's being put down on paper in the little time we have with the capacity that exists within our government bodies? I mean, it simply isn't possible, from my view, to do dozens and dozens of things all at the same time. And I don't yet see a clear sense of prioritization or an identification of what the most important policies will be. And at the same time, Eight years is basic. Eight years to invest in major infrastructure projects is essentially uh, we're, we're basically already at 2030. I mean, you can think of that as we needed to start yesterday or or years ago if we're going to build out all of the infrastructure we're going to need. The, just as one example of that, the federal government's plan calls for 
almost 35 megatons of carbon capture and storage facilities. And regardless of whether you think that's a good policy or a bad policy, uh, the challenge is it, it, that is as much, almost as much as the whole world is doing today in terms of carbon capture. And to build that out in eight years uh, is really hard to imagine how we're going to possibly do that at that pace and scale. So what that all leads me to is that we, we really need to use our basic tools like carbon pricing as deeply and robustly as we possibly can. In other words, if we can make carbon pricing work smarter and work harder for us, it is going to clear up some of the backlog we currently have in terms of how we're going to implement all of these different policies across a range of different economic sectors. Carbon pricing, as you know, is one policy that sends a signal across the entire economy that incents every single actor to take actions big and small to reduce their emissions. Um, and I know you have a policy that you're working on to bring in certain kinds of anesthetics and, and uh, different kinds of greenhouse gases within, to that, within that system so it can work even harder and smarter. And I think that's, that's a fantastic thing. But that I think is really why it's so critical now to have advocates like CCL go talk to MPs and parliamentarians to say, look, we have a great plan on paper now. But the, the paper won't matter at all if we aren't able to show meaningful reductions this decade and set ourselves on the path for that ultimate goal of net zero. And doing that is going to require making some changes to carbon pricing. So that's what I want to talk about next is, you know, what are we looking at in terms of changes to car the carbon pricing system? And I think many of them um, really do dovetail or even correspond with some of the, the asks that you're making. So would, I'll, I'll share some of my thoughts on them and then would, would welcome some discussion on it as well. Maybe the first thing just to kind of uh, set the table on this is, you know, in our research, what we find is carbon pricing, depending on how it would be implemented, and specifically the federal carbon tax now I'm referring to, is going to achieve something like 125 megatons of emissions reductions by 2030 at current rates and schedules. And that's really significant because depending on how you count the 40% goal, that's already, a, that's about 40% of the emissions reductions we need to complete, right? And it's by far the largest emissions reductions lever we have. There's no other policy that comes even close. Uh, for a while, you know, the clean fuel standard is another policy that gets discussed a lot. It's been ratcheted back and watered down. And today, I think it's expected to do about 20 megatons of reductions. So 20 megatons versus 120, 125 megatons, right? We're talking about six times the impact. So if we're going to use that policy, and by the way, there's obviously all the other benefits of carbon pricing that you well know, like it's the only policy that generates revenue to return to Canadians. It's more cost effective, et cetera, et cetera. I won't go into that because I'm pretty sure you're all familiar with that. But if we are going to uh, have carbon pricing live up to its potential, the first thing that I think we need to do is think about how we're going to ensure that policy is as fair as possible to different kinds of particular groups across Canada so that the policy can at least endure. Because while we're worrying about improving it, and that's critical, and I'm going to talk about that in just a couple of minutes, we can't, I think, lose sight of the fact, and I'm sure many of this group will be very well aware of the fact that we currently have a leadership race in the Conservative Party where many of the candidates are talking about removing the carbon pricing system, the, the consumer element of that anyway, what they, they call the carbon tax. So whether it's the Conservatives or whether it's other, uh, other politicians who have some trepidation trepidation, trepidation or, or um, you know, opposition to carbon pricing, and that could include at the provincial level, I think what's important is to point out how can the policy actually be improved and try to give those politicians a stake in the system to say, okay, look, if you have concerns about the way the policy is operating today, then try to improve it. Don't throw it out but it can always be made better. We're on a constant journey of how to use this tool as effectively as we possibly can. And at Clean Prosperity, one of the things that we focus on in that regard is looking at uh, the impact on small businesses, for example, small and medium enterprises, so-called SMEs. And it is true today, as you may know, 
that those small businesses pay something like, depending on the province, 20 to 30% of the carbon taxes that are paid into the system, and they collect back 7% of the revenues. So that is a fair thing to try to address, to say, is there a way in which small businesses can be treated more fairly by the system? Not to mention the fact that even those 7% of revenues that they are entitled to actually come back today in the form of grant programs that are fairly cumbersome to access for a small business owner. And I say that as someone who was a small business owner before starting my current job. So what about the idea of, of doing a small business tax cut, for example, or if providing another way to directly return revenue to all small businesses so they can benefit without having to file additional paperwork, right? That would be one example of trying to make the system fairer today. Another example would be as it pertains to rural residents. You know, today, um, as you will likely know, rural households get a 10% top up on their rebate or climate action incentive payment. And that's helpful because there is a case to be made that rural residents have uh, face higher costs than urban dwellers because they have further to drive because they live in older homes that tend to be less efficient from a heating and cooling perspective on average. So that, that's, a, in our view, a, a fair approach. But the, our research suggests that those rural residents are actually facing, uh, on average, about a 20% higher co cost than urban residents. So what about making that top up that's 10% today, 20%? to try to accommodate the average cost that those rural households face. To me, that would be another example of the existing government or a future government trying to make this policy as fair as possible to different groups around the country. You probably also saw, or many of you may have, that the, the commissioner of, uh, on the environment um, came out with some reports last week. And one of the things that they also spoke about in that report was the impact on Indigenous communities and the way the program could be fair to Indigenous communities. So to us, all of these ideas are important to try to, rep to, try to show that this policy can attempt to be uh, as fair as possible to different groups within Canada. And that is a way, I believe, to make that program uh, maintain the level of public support that it's going to need on a long journey we're on together. This is a multi-decade decarbonization effort. And what we absolutely don't want to see is carbon pricing come in and out and in and out. That will blunt its impact because it will people can't make long-term decisions if they think there's a risk that this policy will be repealed. And so um, trying to take steps to make the to make the policy fair to small business, to rural residents, to indigenous communities, et cetera, is in my view, one of the best ways to try to make sure the policy endures. And if it endures, that, that, that's fundamental to it having as much impact as it can. So I'd encourage you to think about that, you know, how it can be designed in a way that can be most uh, beneficial and, and fairest to, to various constituencies. Now, if we can keep the policy going, which is critical, the next question becomes, how do we make it as impactful as we possibly can? And one of the things that is top of mind for me, and I believe top of mind for you uh, as advocates of this policy, is that carbon pricing is, in my view, is going to need to move on the industrial side of things from a tax that applies to only a share of emissions, which today is on average about 20% of emissions from steel mills and cement kilns and oil refineries is charged the carbon tax. And there are reasons for that, competitiveness reasons, which we can get into. But if we are going to fully decarbonize Canada's economy, we are going to need to move to a system where those industrial emitters are facing the full carbon tax. Those industrial emissions represent over 40% of Canada's emissions. So if we're going to get to net zero, it's very hard to see how we will do it with a leading policy that only applies to a fraction of those emissions. And I would say of all the plans that were presented in the emissions reduction plan uh, that the federal government released in March, one of my concerns, although there were many areas which I thought they, uh, which I was pleased to see, there are many areas, the steps they've taken that I thought were, were encouraging, but one that, that concerns me is that there is not a requirement or I don't see a path towards charging for an increasing share of industrial emissions this decade. 
our research suggests that if we could do that, if we could move from a partial charge of heavy industry to a full charge of heavy industry, which you would have to do gradually over the course of the decade, you could generate something like 45 megatons of additional emissions reductions by 2030. And I really think we are going to need those 45 megatons, not only because it's always better to cut sooner and faster where it can be economically manageable, but because I believe that the plan is laid out is going to be very difficult, as I alluded to earlier, to fully implement in time. So I do think that moving to, to full pricing on distant emissions is going to be a critical part of actually Canada decarbonizing uh, this decade and setting ourselves along the path for the next two decades to net zero. Today, as you may know, the main way in which industrial emitters face a carbon price is actually through provincial systems. It's not through the federal system anymore, even though a lot of attention gets paid to the federal carbon tax. The reality is that the federal industrial system is used primarily as a benchmark because the federal government has told provinces that they can put in their own systems as long as they meet certain minimum criteria in order to gain equivalency. And that is where the main issue is today, is that the requirements from the federal government for what provinces have to do to gain equivalency does not include a requirement, uh, what's often referred to as a tightening rate, which is to say uh, a gradual increase in the amount of emissions that are charged a carbon price. So in our view, the way it should work today is if you take, let's take a simple example, let's take an oil refinery uh, and let's assume because it's different in every province, but let's assume on average, it's, they're paying for about 20% of the emissions on a typical barrel of oil. Now in our view, that should rise gradually over time next year to 22 or 23%, then you're at 25, 27, 30, 35, et cetera, until you eventually have a path probably sometime in the 2030s to 100% coverage of those emissions, perhaps even a little bit earlier. But today, the, um, the system that is about, the systems from the provinces that are about to be approved by the federal government this summer do not require that. In other words, those systems can continue to charge 20% of emissions a year in and year out through 2030 at least. There is potential that it may be, there may be a midterm evaluation later this decade, but that's locking in a program that unfortunately isn't living up to its full potential. And one of the reasons that's so important, uh, there are many reasons, and I already talked about the emissions reductions potential, but of course, if that can be done, if we can charge on a greater share of emissions, it may relieve the need to put in place other regulations that are inevitably going to take a long time to get into place. I'm thinking of things like a clean electricity standard, a go a oil and gas emissions cap. Those can still be done. They may be complementary, but typically regulations take multiple years to put in place. And the carbon pricing system is here and available to us now to use if it, was, uh, if it could be strengthened in the way it's designed. All of that, of course, would have to be combined with a border carbon adjustment, which I know is a policy that CCL has worked on and continues to work on. And that really is going to be the key here is that as we move towards fuller pricing domestically, we do need to pr protect our domestic industries from competition, uh, from, uh, from uh, entities outside of our borders who aren't facing those kinds of environmental regulations or carbon pricing. I think that's, that, that's a, a fair policy. You know, one last thing I will point out about this, and you may be aware of, is that if we're going to have a border carbon adjustment that includes not only a charge for importers, but also a rebate to exporters who are sending goods outside of Canada, as I believe heavy industry would want, and as I think the, uh, the, the facts merit, we will actually need a full carbon price in order to, under WTO law, be able to rebate our exporters for their domestic carbon prices. So in other words, if we maintain today's system, if we don't move to a full industrial carbon price and we continue to charge only on a share of emissions, we will not be able to provide rebates to our exporters because it is not compliant with WTO law, at least the best reading of WTO law. We haven't actually had a case come before the courts because this is all, none of this has been implemented, but 
but uh, the thinking is that that would not be allowed. Okay, so I would say if we're looking at in increasing the impact, and I, I'm going to uh, look to wrap up in a couple minutes because I want to take your questions, but just uh, I'll say that if you're looking to increase the impact of the policy, increasing the share of emissions charged by provinces to industrial emitters, which means the federal government has to strengthen its minimum criteria. That's the big prize, I think, here when you combine it with border carbon adjustments. But there are a couple of other things that I would highlight, and I'll mention them just briefly. Um, one is that we need to provide uh, all actors in Canada, but particularly heavy industry, with more certainty that the pricing schedule will, in, in fact, increase to $170 a ton as contemplated in, in the policy. Because a concern, if you talk to uh, industry associations or individual companies around Canada is that they're not confident or they're not, they have some worry that that carbon price will be dismantled uh, when a future government comes in. And you could see why they would have that concern, especially if you hear some politicians talking about wanting to repeal the carbon tax constantly. And that is blunting the potential impact of the policy today because, both, because companies are hesitant to invest millions, if not billions of dollars on a policy that might disappear and, and take away the business case for, that, for those investments. And so what's going to be really important, and the federal government has indicated an interest in doing this, so I think it's important for, for groups uh, from civil society to talk about the importance of them actually doing it, is to put in place measures that would increase the likelihood that that carbon pricing schedule will be maintained. One way to do that is through contracts for difference, which I won't go into now, but we can talk about in the questions if people want. But I think that certainty is going to be really critical. And a last piece that we've talked about is that, look, if you're going to, you know, in order to use carbon pricing to its maximum impact, you know, one thing the government could consider doing, is, and you see some proposals uh, uh, in this regard in the U.S., is consider giving itself the ability to increase the carbon price beyond the written schedule if certain emissions reductions are not met. So you could imagine that by 2025 or let's say 2026, when the federal government has already targeted a 20% emission uh, reduction goal, if that 20% threshold isn't hit, maybe the federal government has the ability to increase the pricing by an additional 10% over and above schedule, just as one illustration of how that might work. So when you put those things together, right, when you make the policy fairer so that it can endure, and then you make adjustments to the policy in order to ensure it has more impact by increasing the share of emissions that are charged, by providing more certainty in terms of the pricing schedule, and by giving the option to raise the price as needed to generate more emissions reductions uh, impact. I think you, yeah, that's a policy that can really, uh, really have a lot of impact. And so as I go to questions, maybe I'll just point out one or two quick things about the, um, my experience in meeting with MPs, because I know many of you are going to meet with MPs very shortly. My experience is often um, that they're going to want to hear that carbon pricing actually does have public support. And while I didn't talk about it a lot today, you know, we have quite a bit of polling on our website and Kathy would likely be familiar with it, showing that carbon pricing actually is popular among Canadians, especially when they know the money is being returned to households. It's in the 65 to sort of support to 30% opposed numbers when you talk about the money's going back to Canadians. So I think emphasizing that is really important, number one. Number two, I would encourage you all, and you may know this already because some of you are very seasoned advocates for this policy, but I would, when you go into those meetings, I would definitely encourage you to think about the fact that the goal is to listen as much as to talk. The goal is really to understand where are those MPs coming from, meet them where they are, and then take them through the logic that you, as you see fit in terms of why pricing or other policies you're advocating or are so important because often those MPs will have some initial questions or initial perspectives that I think uncovering at the early part of a meeting and hearing from them saying, what do you think about this? Where are you at on these issues before I dive into you know, my, my perspective here can be a really helpful way to then have a full conversation and sort of address some of the concerns or questions or biases that they may come in with. 
And then the last thing, and this will be my final point, is I would just think of these uh, these efforts as uh, really an, uh, a journey, like an ongoing journey that you're not there for one meeting, but you're there to start a long term conversation, hopefully with some of these policymakers where you can have follow up meetings where you can present additional information afterward to be helpful to answer questions they've asked and hopefully move them over time to uh, to see the benefits of the perspectives you're advocating for, because it's been my experience that um, you know, one meeting really is just the start of a conversation, but it's a really important start. So I'm, I'm glad you're all taking that. Uh, I wish you good luck in those meetings. And uh, with that, why don't I take some questions? Thank you so much, Michael. That was amazing. I, you gave us so much information that, you know, 45 extra megatons that we fully prioritize in, in the industrial uh, sector. Uh, and, five or 110 megatons just from carbon pricing alone, nothing comes close to that. You know, you're driving home the point of why we are so focused on carbon pricing at Citizens Climate Lobby. It, it is the heavy lifter and um, you've given us a lot to work with. So um, yeah, thank you that, and, and yeah. So now if people would like to ask questions, um, I'd ask for them to be brief um, and on point. Um, in, in the wheelhouse of carbon pricing, uh, just <laughs> jump in and that would be lovely. And Kathy, I do have, I see I have two direct messages with questions already. Should I, should I read those out or? Yeah, just go for it. Yeah. Okay. So somebody's asked me to explain contracts for differences. Um, so, uh, so the brief answer on that is that um, what that is, is uh, let's let's take 2030 as an example, right? What the federal government could do is they say, okay, we will sign a contract with um, Algoma Steel. I'm just using an example, right, of a, of a particular facility, and say, look, if if you Algoma takes steps, these decarbonization steps, maybe it's putting in place an electric arc furnace as an example. What we, the federal government, will do is we will provide you funding support to cover any gap between $170 and the carbon price that prevails in 2030. So in 2030, if the price is actually $170, the federal government owes that company zero, right? But if the carbon price is, let's just say $100, then the federal government under the example I just gave would owe Algoma Steel $70 a ton for a certain number of tons, because it would be the gap between the 170 and the actual price that ended up happening in 2030, which in my example is 100. And of course, there's other ways you could structure it where there's upside for the government, where they'd say, look, we're guaranteeing a price of up to 150 a ton. And if it's actually 170 in 2030, you company have to pay us $20, right? But if it's $100, we'll pay you $50 and onward and onward. There's many variations, but that's the basic idea of pricing certainty. It's a contract that puts some financial um, implications behind the pricing target not being reached. Um, okay, the next question that I have here is uh, a really good, a really a detailed, nuanced one. It's a good question. Someone asked about, and I won't read the names, just I don't know, wasn't sure if they DM me to be private, but I'll just read the contents of the question. It's concerning a tightening of industrial carbon pricing. I had understood, says this commenter, that the federal government's current review of the OBPS, which is the output-based pricing system or the industrial pricing system, uh, proposes a 2% tightening rate per annum, subject concerningly to a discount on the tightening rate for trade exposed industries. Yeah, so that's a really good question. And I didn't, I didn't clarify that in my comments. So let me take the chance to do that now. The federal government, still has its own system, which it, there are some provinces and territories that are using the federal government's own system, okay? And wherever that system applies, this commenter is correct, that there is a 2% tightening rate, which means that if the 80% of emissions are charged in 2022, that 2023 would be you know, 78 and 2024 would be 76 and 74 and 72 and onward and onward. So that there is a tightening, or in other words, there's an increasing share of emissions being charged. Now that's great. The problem is that for the provinces who have their own systems, the federal government is not requiring them to do the same thing that the federal government system itself is doing. So 
which seems very strange, actually. Like the federal government has recognized the need to do this. They're doing it in their own system. And that's good. I should have said that in my comments. And so it's good that the commenter pointed this out. But what they're not doing is requiring the provinces to do it. So hopefully that's clear, but I'm happy to take further questions on that. Um, and I see Tom has his hand up. Hi, if I can jump in. Um, first of all, as an easy one, do you think uh, it's sort of two parts? So, will do you think, uh, in terms of approval rating, the visibility of the income side, the climate income that's coming um, with a paint with a quarterly payment, the first, although the first one's delayed till July with the double payment, uh, do you think that's that's going to help? And I also have a BCA question that's much more nerdy. <laughs> okay, thanks for softening me up with the with the first question. I appreciate that. Yeah, so thanks for that point. And just so most folks probably know, but just in case, I'll just say that um, the the rebates that go back to Canadians uh, under the federal pricing system have up until now, as many of you may know, gone through the tax system. So when you file your return each year, you will get a credit. Uh, for that rebate that will apply on your notice of assessment. What's happening this year, as Tom is alluding to, is that the federal government is changing that. So there'll be direct payments made to Canadians uh, in relevant, juris relevant jurisdictions in the form of a direct deposit in most cases, or perhaps check in some other cases. Those will occur quarterly starting in July. The amounts won't change, but the way it's being delivered will, and that will absolutely increase visibility and there's no doubt in my mind, Tom, that that will massively, uh, well, maybe massive is a bit of a strong, strong word, but potentially massively and certainly very significantly change the knowledge of the rebate and therefore people's views on the program. We've been polling on this fairly regularly for the past three years. And there's two things that make me say that. The first is very few people still know about the rebate on the carbon price amazingly right because all of us probably know first and secondly it's been there for three years and it's, people are getting it but it's about one third of people when you poll you find one third of people know about it and the second thing is when you tell people about it you know you get half of the people who oppose the policy as soon as you just tell them that all the money is going back not even what they individually are getting just hey this money goes back to canadians half of those who said they opposed it one question earlier say oh you know what I either support it or I can accept it now. So they remove their opposition. So yeah, I think a big game changer and really excited to see that happen. It's something that we work on a lot. I believe CCL worked on quite a bit and it's really great to see that policy change happen. Um, so yeah, with that, maybe I'll hear what your BCA question is. Yeah, so I'm, I'm glad you uh, referred to the border carbon adjustments because I, I was concerned about your comment about ratcheting up the industrial price without mm -hmm. some sort of uh, leakage treatment. Yeah. Uh, one concern as a, as a country that uh, exports a lot of fossil fuels, I'm always concerned about the prospect of um, an example where a Canadian uh, fossil fuel company exports, or 100% of its exports go, uh, or by definition exports, anyway, would get a credit so that the price uh, would not actually apply to those emissions generated by a fossil fuel producer. Is that, am I on the right track? Yeah, yeah, you are. Yeah, so there's, there's various ways that this could be implemented, right? And, um, but it's certainly true that one way this could be designed is that all of the price, all of the um, emissions on any export, including a barrel of oil, to use your example, could be uh, rebated at the border, which would mean that that barrel of oil would face zero carbon taxes. Um, and that's obviously a policy choice, but the reason it would be done, if, if it were to be done, would be to um, allow that barrel of oil, or for that matter, that ton of steel or ton of uh, clinker to compete on a level playing field with other products in that jurisdiction um, that don't face a carbon price. Typically, by the way, that rebate would only occur um, if it, it would depend a little bit on where it's being sent and what the regulations are in that jurisdiction. You quickly get into a very complicated kind of analysis, but it is true that that could be, uh, that, that could be the implication um, and happy to discuss that a little further if you want, but maybe I'll just stop there for a sec. 
maybe offline. Thanks very much. Yeah, sure. I see a question coming in from Laura, I think. Um, she's asking me thoughts on collaboration and in order to ensure the policy endures, saying that uh, government, if a government asks the opposition parties for ideas to improve and then communicates the change publicly, example here that rural residents have 20% higher costs, make an ongoing public dialogue. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great thought, Laura. I, I really, you know, I'm constantly asking myself, and apologies, I hear some noise outside, so I don't know if you're picking that up. Sorry if you are, but the, um, the we, we need to find a way to take this policy and make it less politically hot. For whatever reason, it has attracted a lot of attention. And that's unfortunate, I would say, because it is such a critical driver of decarbonization. And of course, as you will know, it's the most small c conservative way to address climate because it involves actually smaller government. It's more affordable. The Ecofiscal Commission, as I'm sure you're familiar with, has studied this. And they said that even the best designed alternative to a carbon price would cost Canadians $1,200 per capita more in 2030, and that's the absolute best designed alternative. So it's quite clear that this policy is gonna be important, but it's also true that in order to address situations that have become politically divisive, you probably do need folks on both sides to come together somewhere in the middle. Um, I would certainly like to see um, some efforts in that regard, and, and you, you cited the rural uh, rebate example. I think that's a very good one, um, especially because there tends to be, unfortunately, I think more, there's an increasing urban rural divide in our politics more broadly. And if we can try to bring people together uh, in areas where there is a legitimate policy concern, like if you're a rural resident, I think you have a valid case to make that, you know, you, you would like to see more of the rebate. And one of the ways to do that, by the way, would be to take on some of the, uh, I didn't mention this in my remarks, but in our research that we published on this, we've shown that actually the GST, which is, uh, of course, today the GST or HST that's charged on the carbon tax is not actually part of the revenue that's returned to Canadians, right? That goes into the general uh, coffers of the government. And really to make it truly revenue neutral, we've suggested that, that the federal government ought to use that money to also pour back into the rebate programs. And they could, if they were to do that, they could fully fund the 20%, uh, the top up to 20% for rural residents without having to take any funding away from other groups. So um, I think there's a real win-win there. Another example of this, by the way, would have been with um, farmers, where you saw the opposition parties led by the conservatives put together a private member's bill in the last parliament talking about how maybe farmers should have a higher exemption rate for different kinds of fuels um, that they pay the carbon tax on for a variety of reasons. And actually the bloc and the NDP uh, supported the conservative motion in that regard. It ended up not getting through because parliament was, uh, was closed due to the election. Um, but uh, it would have, I think it would be nice for the federal government to come together with the opposition parties on that issue too. They have made some changes to the policy recently. So maybe behind the scenes, they are talking. Um, but for sure, I think your broader point is a really good one. How do we find ways to, to look for common ground, to encourage opposition parties to talk about how they would do the policy? Let's have, a, let's have an exchange of ideas here within the context of we need the policy, but what's the best way to design it? Um, so anyway, that's maybe a bit of a, that, that, uh, maybe a bit of a longer answer than I intended to give, but hopefully that's helpful. I see it's provoked uh, another, uh, yeah, and, and, and there's something that says need to give all parties some wins. Kathy, I'm just aware I'm getting close to 115. I do see one other question. Should I take that or what, what's your guidance here? One question here in the room, if that's okay. Of um, course. Yeah, if we go a little over time, you'll be cool. Yeah, no problem for me, as long as it's okay for you. Oh, yeah. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Michael, following up on the contract for differences, I understand one of the tenets of the Westminster system of governance is. Oh, I think I've lost you. 
I think Kathy, you're on mute actually somehow. Let's see. Yeah. There we go. I understand one of the impacts of uh, the Westminster system and how it might affect contracts and differences is that uh, under the Westminster system, one government is constrained from binding a future government. So how would you address that with contracts for differences? Yeah, I think there's a few ways. So it's an interesting question. And, you know, I have to say some of the, the legal ins and outs of this are not something I'm as well versed on as I ought to be. So I'm happy to talk offline if there's some things that you see. But one of the ways it's been talked about up to now, and maybe this helps, I'm not sure, but um, you've got some... Um, You've got some entities within the government, uh, like the or I guess they're 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 semi-autonomous bodies, but I'm thinking of something like the Canada Infrastructure Bank, where you have a pool of funds today that could be brought to bear to um, to uh, sign contracts that where the repayment the repayment of those contracts, whether it be debt or, or other kinds of arrangements, would be contingent on what the prevailing carbon price is today. So um, I think because that body, uh, because of the structure of that body and the fact that they have this dedicated pool of funds, you'd be able to do that through there. It's possible there may be, need to be legislative changes as well, though, if the government were to go through a different entity. Um, but that's a, that's, that's a question maybe we could take offline. I see another question came in or two more questions came in through the chat. Kathy, should I try to answer those? Yeah, we, we have a 15 minute gap between now and the next session. So as long as you're okay with that, that's okay. We can end in the next five minutes. So we can that's have at least seven minutes. That'd be great. I'm sure folks would, would appreciate a little bit of a break. Yeah, for sure. So I'll try to do these fairly quickly. I just I appreciate that folks took the time to write them. So I want to try to get at least a quick answer. So let's see. Um, there's the next question says we have a U of M economist that writes in the newspaper frequently and says that the C tax is expensive. The households in NB did not get back more than they paid in 2020, and that he has never seen any significant emissions reductions for a C tax. Any tips for a response? Sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, it would depend a little bit on the details of what he's saying, but I mean, I think the numbers are are clearly laid out in the uh, both the federal government documents and also we have a uh, there's a site called Fair Path Forward. .ca that folks can go to and you can enter any province such as Manitoba and the number of people in the household and it'll show you uh, the rebates that are being provided. So um, the numbers are, are I think there. I'm not sure why this person is saying that and perhaps they're referring to the PBO report that came out, um, it, what was it, a couple of months ago that suggested that the overall economic impact of the carbon tax may leave some households worse off. But of course what that uh, you can look on our website for the, our response to that report because we believe it was a very um, misguided report. It only looked at certain economic measures and not others. Um, the last thing I would say here is, you know, we have the example of BC, right? So BC has had a carbon tax since 2008. It's been the fastest growing economy in Canada for most of that time. So if carbon taxes were really that hard, that, that painful for an economy, you know, how could BC be growing so fast during that time? And at the same time, we've seen the emissions intensity in BC decline. Uh, it is true we haven't seen absolute reductions uh, beyond the first few years of the program, um, but we have seen, even at the small rates today, declines in the emissions per capita and the emissions per unit of GDP in BC, and that's even at small levels of carbon taxes. There's a great policy options piece actually that you could look up by Dave Sawyer where he expands on that a bit. So I would, I would look at those cases as one example. I would also mention to people that, you know, of course, pricing, the, the reason why it works is because it takes time to get people to change their behavior. So you need a number of years with a rising price until you get the impacts. Um, so uh, it's, uh, yeah, it, we could talk for hours about that. I'll, I'll leave it there for now, but uh, hopefully that, that helps. Um, the last point is, uh, the last question rather is, is it true that hospitals pay more than they receive back? Um, yeah, I think, well, so it would depend on the hospital and what the situation you have today is that the federal government currently uses 3% of the revenues that are generated by the carbon tax for what's called the mush sector and indigenous groups. Um, MUSH would include hospitals, I think it's municipalities, universities, schools, and hospitals is what M-U-S-H MUSH stands for. Um, and that money, because it's only 3%, has been rotated around 
Some years it's gone to hospitals, some years to schools, et cetera. Um, I think it is true that some hospitals, perhaps many, are paying more than they receive back. I think that's another area where the government could look at trying to figure out a way to, um, uh, to provide greater benefit to those hospital systems. But I think the only other thing I would say there is there are other programs I think the federal government would point to that help uh, folks like hospitals who have, you know, one of their biggest expenses is kind of heating and cooling bills to be more, to have greater uh, energy efficiency. Um, as well as to try to switch to more renewable energy. So I think they would say there's a broader package of policies that does help benefit hospitals and hopefully get them to reduce their carbon tax bills over time. Um, but I, I do think that's another area where the government could look for policy. And maybe that's another area for common ground with the opposition parties, as a previous questioner had pointed out. So just given the time, maybe I'll leave it there for now. Um, but thanks again for having me. Thank you, Kathy. It's, uh, it's been a pleasure. Thanks so much, Michael. If you all want to uh, unmute your microphones, that would be great. Thanks, Mike. That was. Thank you, Michael. Great. Thanks so much. Thank Best you. Best to you today. And, uh, Thank you. Soon. Okay. We'll talk. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Awesome, Michael. Thanks so much. Great. Okay, so we have a, an eight minute break right now. And when we get back, we'll just do a brief discussion on, on what we'll be doing next. So um, yeah, thanks everybody. Just, uh, that's it. Just take eight minutes. I'm, uh, I'll be back too. I'm just gonna let it go.